Okay, so this is the first of several lectures on decision trees. So this is an example of a decision tree. Uh, this is just a, a, a little tree that predicts whether I'm gonna run into traffic on my way home from work. And um, the way the model operates is it asks if it's raining. And then if it's raining, it says, is there construction? And if there's construction, it says, yes, you'll probably run into traffic. And otherwise, um, if it's raining but no construction, then it says, okay, you probably won't run into traffic, and so, and so on. And, and if it's not raining, it asks if it's rush hour, and then, you know, and so on and so forth. Okay, so, that, so that's how it works. It's a logical model. It works on kind of if-then uh, statements. Okay, so why do we care about trees? So trees are interpretable. They're, they're really popular in like medical applications because they kind of mimic the way people like to reason. You know, you, you want to think like if I had, if the patient, I'll, I'll test the patient for this. If the patient has this, then we'll check, you know, we'll go check this other thing. Otherwise we'll go do this other set of things, okay? So um, it's, it's a nice uh, way of thinking about the problem, like partitioning it into smaller pieces. It also models discrete outcomes nicely because each leaf is a prediction. So you can make different predictions in different leaves. Uh, for different discrete outcomes. Also, these models are powerful, they're nonlinear, and they can be as complex as you need them to be, although if they're very complex, if they're very big, then they're not going to be that interpretable. Now, the algorithm, the two main um, traditional algorithms for decision trees are CART and C4.5, and both of them made it into the top 10 from 2008. So there was this big paper that came out with a tutorial of the top 10 algorithms in data mining, and two of these 10 were decision tree algorithms, CART and C4.5. Now these are old algorithms, and they're from times when computers were a million times slower. So as you can imagine, um, uh, these algorithms are very efficient. Okay, so, so there are some very uh, cute historical examples of, of successes with decision trees. So here's one where British Petroleum had their system for separating gas and oil in, in an offshore platform, and then they used C4.5, and it replaced a bunch of hand-designed rules, and it saved the company millions of dollars. And then there's another example of learning how to fly a plane on a flight simulator in 1992. Okay, so how are these, how are these decision trees usually constructed? Well, the way they're in the traditional route, in C4.5 and CART, the way that they're constructed is that you take all the data, which in, in our case is times that I've traveled home from work, and then you try to find what the feature is that has the most information about the outcome. So in this case, it happens to be the weather, so, so rain. And so we're going to split the data into two pieces based on rain, because rain is the most informative about traffic. Okay, so we split into two pieces. And now um, from there, we do everything recursively. So we take the data from when it was raining and then we find the most important um, or the, the most um, informative factor for uh, traffic from just that subset of data. So it's, it's a way of recursively partitioning the data into pieces and finding the most important factor each time. Okay, so then we keep doing this and we grow the tree, okay, grow the tree all the way till it's done. And then once the tree is grown, then we'll greedily prune it back up. Okay? So we'll greedily prune pieces of it back up to try to make the tree smaller so that it is less likely to overfit. Okay, so you could probably say, well, you know, that's a good way to do it if, it's, if you have a computer from 1984, but is this still a good way to build a tree now? And that's actually a very good question. And um, the modern algorithms for decision tree learning actually don't do greedy splitting and pruning, um, but we'll, um, we'll talk about those later. But you know, surprisingly, these, these algorithms do, do sort of shockingly well and they produce beautiful, beautiful and sparse trees. It's like, you know, well, I mean, the algorithms are a pile of heuristics, right? It's greedy splitting and greedy pruning. So, um, you know, it, but you see these gorgeous models. It's kind of like, you know, you have a beautiful sports car and then you open the hood and then you see just like a pile of like rusty old pipes or something like that. Like that's, <laughs> that's kind of these old decision tree algorithms, right? Um, they produce beautiful interpretable models, but what's under the hood is kind of a pile of heuristics. Okay, <laughs> but they do burn quickly and, and you can use them for very big data sets. 
Okay, so I'm going to use a running example of a, of a very small data set. I'm going to put the whole data set on the screen. And um, the data set predicts whether a customer is, is willing to wait for a table at a restaurant. Okay, and I'm just listing all the features. So the features are things like whether there's another restaurant nearby and the customer could go there instead, um, whether it's a weekend, whether there's a waiting area in the restaurant where the, comfort, where the customer would feel comfortable waiting, um, whether the customer has plans after dinner, um, the price of the restaurant, uh, the, some information about the weather, and then which restaurant it is. I just picked four, four nice restaurants. Um, so Mateo is fancy and Juju is, is very nice and Blue Corn Cafe is casual and, and there's a pizza restaurant that's, um, that's very casual. And then the wait time and then whether or not the restaurant is crowded. Okay, so those are features. Here is our, um, here is our data set. That's the whole data set. Uh, the um, the uh, the label is whether or not the customer will stay and wait for the table, um, and so those are marked in kind of blue and green. And then here are all the observations, and then the features are on the columns, obviously. Okay, so this is an example of a decision tree that we might construct uh, from these data, and um, you know we might uh, ask first whether or not it's crowded. Um, and if, if it's full, we, if, if, if it's not crowded, maybe the customer will just, you know, say, ah, I don't want to wait for a table. There's, no, there's nobody in here. I don't want to wait for a table. Okay. If there's some, a few people in there, maybe the customer will wait. If the restaurant is full, then we, we maybe want to know if the customer has plans because if they, have, if, they, if, they, if they have plans, they may not want to wait for the table. And if they don't have plans, well, it depends which restaurant it is. <laughs> so... You know, if it's Mateo, maybe they would wait, blue corn, maybe not, and so on. Okay, so you get the idea. That's what we're trying to construct. Okay, so we'll do this greedy tree induction that I was talking to you about, where you start at the top of the tree and you grow it by splitting the features one by one. And to split, we're going to look how impure the node is. And then, um, and, and it's impurity with respect to the, the label. Oh, and the label, I forgot to tell you, the label is whether or not the customer will, will stay at the restaurant, which is the right column there. Okay. So, and then in the end, we, um, we assign the leaf nodes the majority vote in the leaf. So you take all the data that fell into the leaf and then you assign the majority vote. And then at the end, we're gonna go back and prune the tree to prevent overfitting. Okay, so now let's just do some intuition for these splitting procedures. Okay, so let's talk about two features that we're thinking about putting at the top of the tree, whether it's crowded and which restaurant it is. And I wanna know, well, which of these two factors gives the most information about the label? So I put all of the data uh, at the top of both features. So there's, um, I think there's six positive and six negative examples. So there, it's an equal number of positives and negatives that go in. And then when, if we split on crowded, then um, as you can see, if, it, that if, if, it's, if there are no customers in the restaurant, there's two negatives, right? Both times that happened, the customers chose not to wait for the table. If there are some customers in the restaurant, then all four times that happened, the customers, the, the new customers chose to wait for the table. And if the restaurant's full, then um, two out of six times they waited and four times they left. Okay, so crowded, whether the restaurant's crowded, um, it has some information about the label in the sense that if you split on it, you get some pure nodes, right? Some nodes that are purely negative or purely positive. Now, if instead you had split on restaurant, then you'll notice there's an equal number of positives and negatives in each restaurant. So essentially, if I'm asking, you know, is which, which of these two factors is the right one to split on? Well, one of them tells you quite a lot about the label and another one tells you literally nothing about the label. Okay, so obviously we would want to split on crowded rather than splitting on which restaurant it is. And then after we split on crowded, maybe we would want to split on plans, for instance, as we continue to create our tree. Okay, so I want to talk about um, the splitting criteria that's used in some of the decision tree algorithms, and it's called information gain. Okay, so what I've, what I've illustrated here is that we are at a specific node in the tree. The rest of the tree is, is up there somewhere. Okay, so get the rest of the tree up there. And then we're going to consider the training data going to that branch, and I've, I've indicated the number of positives and the number of negatives that go into the branch. And then if I split on, if I split on this, uh, this feature called A, which happens to be a color feature, 
then um, there's the notation for the number of positives and the number of negatives in each of the in each of the branches. Okay, and so the training probabilities in branch J look like this. So this is the fraction of positives that go into the leaf and the fraction of negatives that go into the leaf. Okay, and what we really would like here is the node to be as pure as possible. So we want um, probabilities that are very uneven, right? If the probabilities were even, that means that that split really didn't help us distinguish the positives from the negatives. So we want splits that give us a um, very low entropy, right? We want splits that that create entropy. Okay, so I want to kind of make this um, concrete. What the what this uh, what this um, information gain criteria is for splitting. So it's actually the difference between the original entropy before you made the split and the entropy after you do the branching. Okay, so this is the entropy of the data before you split. And then this is the average entropy after you split. And you're averaging over uh, the, the different branches after you split. Okay, so when we think about which of these two we want to split on, intuitively, it seems like crowded would be the right one. Um, but let's see if we can make that concrete by calculating the, in, the information gain. Okay, so if we calculate the information gain based on um, the crowded split, then um, before we split, it was half and half, right? Half, um, half positive, half negative. And then after we split, um, I just want to remind you that that the first, the leftmost branch was all all negative, so it's zero and one, and then the middle branch was all positive, so it was one and zero, and then the third the the third option was two out of six. Okay, so it was, so it was two out of six positive and four out of six negative, and then we're weighting each of these by the number of um, by the number of examples that fell. In, into each of the leaves. So that was two, um, two, four, and six. Okay, so that's where those numbers come from. And then we compute it and we get 0.541 bits, okay? So if we had computed the same criteria for the restaurant split, in fact, the information gain would reveal that we gained actually no information when we split because after we split, we had the same number of positives and negatives in each branch. So we actually gained no information at all. And so we would choose to split on the crowded feature rather than the restaurant feature. Okay, so so far I've discussed one splitting criteria for decision trees, which is information gain. That's used in C4.5. And I still have a lot of things that I want to discuss with decision trees. I want to discuss other possible splitting criteria, the pruning criteria. I want to talk about what CART does, which is the other um, algorithm that was in the top 10 in 2008. I also, um, and also CART and C4.5, they are among the most widely used machine learning models in history. I mean, these are, are still very, very well used. Um, and I also want to talk about some uses for these greedy uh, tree splitting algorithms. They're actually very useful in practice for constructing things like forests and boosted decision trees. And then um, afterward, I'll talk about what happens if you don't want to be greedy. Thanks.